This is the first in a series of presentations on the life cycle of the salmon and the work of the Tweed Foundation. So we appropriately start with the spawning of salmon and then the next stages which are the egg, elvin, fry and par stages. What affects the salmon in getting to the spawning areas? Well that's the obstructions that humans have created over the last few hundred years and then also what affects the numbers of fry and par within the river. Not just the human effects but also the natural processes which are going on beneath the surface. And this all draws from the huge amount of information that the Tweed Foundation has been collecting since 1992. Uh, the huge uh, database that we have on obstructions and the wealth of information that we've collected from the electrofishing surveys throughout the catchment. This is where it all begins with the henfish. This is uh, from the Jedwater cutting the red and you can see her removing the fine sediment. You can actually see some eggs coming up there as well. She's cutting the red to re remove the finer substrate and ensure that oxygen will get to the eggs when they're, they're laid in the gravel. This is a common site throughout the catchment from late October through to February, March. The lighter area with the the line round it is where a number of henfish have been spawning. You can see the finer se sediment has been removed and you can see the, the darker substrate around which hasn't been turned over. The key factor for well development at this stage is temperature uh, and the concept of degree days. It requires 440 degree days for the hatching uh, of the egg to the, to the elven. That means at a temperature of around 3 degrees, that is about 145 days uh, for hatching. So temperature has a key role to play. Egg size also has an important role and the trade-offs to be had for the female and the, the size of the eggs that are laid. The female may choose to lay lots of smaller eggs, which means that when the elvin hatches they have less um, maternal provisioning, or she may choose to, to have larger eggs uh, which means that she can only produce less eggs but those eggs may have a better chance of survival. All these complications and complexities are going on from a very early stage in the life cycle. And here's a picture of just an elvin in the, in the gravel. A very vulnerable stage in the life cycle. The distribution of salmon. Salmon are pretty much, juvenile salmon are pretty much ubiquitous throughout the catchment from um, above the tidal limit all the way to the top of the Tweed and all the major tributaries. The distribution largely follows uh, the third order stream distribution throughout the catchment. So these are really main channels, it's not the smaller channels, this is where that's where you find juvenile trout a lot more. But behind this map there are the, the current obstruction distribution which is relatively limited uh, we can see the areas of red, these are the areas that we know from obstruction database to be um, to, to not have juvenile salmon above them. And there are only a few areas that really are significantly affected. The reservoirs of <laughs> Tala, Fruid, Megget um, and Witada are the, the reservoirs that we, we can't do anything about. We then have two waterfalls and it's the policy of the Tweed Commission not to remove natural obstructions. We don't have many of those, just the Eden Water, the Stitchell Lynn and the College Burn. And then there's only one obstruction in the Tweed system uh, on the, the Willow Water, a ford, which is the only pro major problem that we know of that, that, that could be sorted out. But this wasn't always the case and uh, the bailiffs and superintendents of the past would be quite impressed to see a map like this because their time was spent largely ma making sure salmon could get to their spawning ground. This is a map of 120 years ago largely from map surveys and uh, evidence provided in Tweed Commission reports and it shows the partial obstructions of the Tweed system. These are ones that would require a particular flow to let the fish get past. There was a famous walker burn called where the saying was in Walkerburn that the fish stopped in Walkerburn. Uh, there was serious issues with abstraction uh, over the cooled face to take water to the mills there. 
we have the photographs of the two cords at Selkirk. The cord at Selkirk was famously blown up, blown up in the 1960s, much to the consternation of the local people. And then once they'd managed to get through there and all the poaching, they would then have to try and get through the Philip Hoff cord as well. Then there's the cord at Denham, which in 1904 washed away, but there's um, written evidence that it was a severe obstruction. And then on the lower till, there was a whole series of cords, the Twizel, Ford, Eatle, and Heather's Law, to name a few. So that was 47% of the catchment, and to add to that, there was another 31% of the catchment completely obstructed to salmon. And we can see the Wittadder, Leader, Gala, particularly the Ale Water, with a whole series of mills, and then other tributaries of the Teviot Water, the Jed, uh, the Kale and the Oxnum. That was another 31%, so that was 78% of the catchment that was severely affected by obstructions. Salmon were largely restricted to spawning in the main channel and in that area there was severe netting, poaching and pollution going on. That provides the context to where we are now. Things are much better than they used to be. And in management um, terms we want to know how quickly salmon recover after an obstruction. This is related always to the <coughs> stocking debate and whether there should be human intervention after the removal of obstructions. Well the Wittada provides one example where nine different obstructions have been removed uh, in the last 15 years and we can see the recovery in our electrofishing results. Back in 1988 there was only about one salmon par per 100 square meters at only two sites. In 1996, that was up to 15.9 at 6 out of 7 sites, and by the year 2000, we had 65 par per 100 square metres at all sites. And there are other examples in the tweed catchments which show that salmon recover very, very quickly. Now to focus on the fry stage of the life cycle, so this is where the elvins have hatched out, and this is an extremely vulnerable part uh, of the life cycle because there are too many salmon fry produced, many of these salmon fry will die and the hatching time is extremely important. Too early and they miss the food supply, uh, yeah, there's no food, if they hatch too late then their competitors have got a march on them and they'll struggle to find their territory and shelter to live in. Also of importance, um, particularly to the sampling that we'll look at, is that fry distribute very locally, so it's only a few hundred meters upstream or downstream so if you monitor numbers of fry they're in, then they're indicative of the local area they're a canary in the mine they're a bioindicator which tells us something about the local environment whether it's a problem with lack of spawning or a problem with the local habitat and this is what we do every summer we have over 700 sites in the tweed system and we're sampling the riffle habitat here with the electrofishing probe here passing a low current through the water. Without this method we would have no idea about the numbers of juvenile fish in the river and it was the Victorians who felt compelled to start the whole stocking and hatchery debate by stocking the rivers because they thought there was nothing there. Electrofishing generally shows there are huge numbers of fry in the river. And we do this method in an identical manner throughout the system do is produce a map of results like this and what we've done is ranked all the results from very low through to medium and high using a very intuitive traffic light system of red, yellow and green and we can quickly convey the results that we find throughout the system. Here we can see the leader water on the right and the gala water on the left and the leader water in particular shows how the main channel spawning is important. This is the average number of fry from three samplings. We can see green sites all the way up the leader water and then numbers drop off in the, the tributaries like the Ernskluch and Boondry to a point where we have no salmon fry at all. And that's fairly similar on the Gala water. We have lower results down the bottom but in the middle stretch is certainly extremely productive and lower numbers further up. In the till system we can see something similar. The Beaumont water and Glen circled there have very good numbers of salmon fry and we can see poor areas where we've got obstructions. So I mentioned the Wooler water 
and then also the upper parts of the Bremish. The Bremish has now been sorted out uh, with a fish pass uh, at a bridge apron further down and that population is recovering. Now to monitor numbers of fish. Uh, we've got an example here of the Teviot system and what we've done here is put the numbers uh, next to each other as circles uh, so we can see consecutive numbers 2007, 2010 and 2013 at each site. And what we see is highly consistent results and that's an indi indication of spawning capacity. This is the lower ale water that I mentioned uh, about the, the series of obstructions and then we can go to the upper ale water where numbers are pretty reasonable but numbers become more variable in the tributaries the Borthwick water is also extremely productive, uh, particularly on the on the lower sections. Again, we see a lot of red green circles there. Slightly different on the Allen water here. Uh, numbers are lower and more variable, and we think this is due to a ford at the bottom of the Allen water. And then a particularly good example of when you have lack of spawning fish is the Slitrick water, and we see generally very low results there and that's due to a rock shelf at the bottom and then occasionally we see greens there back in 2010 uh, where a few salmon have managed to get through and to spawn. We've then got the rural water again which has highlighted a problem which we didn't think it has a fish pass but it tends to block up and then we can look at a few one other area the kale water extremely productive on the lower sections and then the salmon leap there, a waterfall, uh, restricts salmon in some years. So back in 2010, uh, the middle circles are all green. And then in 2007, most of the results are highlighted as red. So that just demonstrates the practical uses of salmon in, in displaying data. We have a couple of case studies. This is the, the Gala water example. In 2006, consistent results. 2009 even more consistent the results and in 2010 a massive crash in the numbers of salmon fry an unprecedented decrease in the numbers of fry and we had to explore the reason for all this uh, it wasn't clear was it pollution was it disease and here's the smoking gun there was a second highest uh, flood event in April since records began in 1960 uh, a flow event of about 78 meters cubed per second and that probably coincided with the emergence of the elvins into the gravel from eggs, sorry, hatching of elvins or the emergence of fry. Whatever the case, from top to bottom the fry were largely removed and the management implication is should we be doing something to pull that out. We carried on our electrofishing surveys and in 2011 the sites uh, 3, 7, 8 and 11 had recovered to some of the highest numbers within the catchment and those numbers uh, became more widespread and improved in 2012. There's just one site there, site code 1, that hasn't recovered. Uh, that's probably due to something else but otherwise the results are all in the very high category. Another example of a flood event was on the Teviot. This was the highest flood event in January since records began. 300 meters cubed per second uh, of flow coming down. Uh, the question was for anglers and uh, landowners was juvenile fish, were juvenile fish affected by this flood event? And we had the baseline of data. We can see mostly all the, the mostly the results are classified in green as high or very high, just one poor result back in 1994. 2005 the numbers were higher than all of the results in 94 and 99 and for par the one-year-olds again all the results either high or very high and most of those results were higher than results in 94 and 99 salmon are extremely resilient so just a few messages to come out of this presentation it's extremely complex what goes on below the water surface. This is just summarizes the physical factors that affect uh, numbers of fry and par, or, or just par in this case. And then on top of that there's all the biological factors going on as well. Uh, things like competition between age classes uh, or within age classes uh, 
uh, predation, etc., etc. This makes the challenge of monitoring quite difficult, uh, and that's why we use a relatively simple method of fry indexing to, to carry that out. Salmon recover very quickly, and that's not just for obstructions but pollution events as well. And we have plenty of examples where electrofishing shows us that uh, the population recovers very quickly and there isn't the requirement for, for human intervention which is often seen as a requirement. Salmon are highly resilient uh, and we've seen that with the past from 120 years ago with all the problems that the salmon has faced they're still here and still present in very good numbers. And finally the tweed is highly productive for juvenile salmon and that's evidence from the electrofishing work that we've carried out throughout the catchment and that's a combination of various things whether it's temperature, habitat, alkalinity all of these have combined to make the tweed one of the, the most productive systems in, in uh, perhaps Europe you could say but certainly in the UK and that means that we ensure that there's a huge production of smolts going out to sea and that's the next stage of the life cycle the trials and tribulations of the salmon